context of this first verse, in Luke 24, it says, Then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the question is, you know, what does the Old Testament tell us about baptism and rebirth? Because we know at the time of Christ, they didn't have a New Testament. So what did the Old Testament say? And that's kind of what we're going to explore line upon line, precept upon precept. So first, let's start with creation, right? And we'll read, fast forward a couple of slides, honey. We'll read from Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the day, or the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. So here in the beginning, in creation, we see some precepts here. You have heaven and earth formed in the midst of the waters. So you have waters above, right? And you have waters below. And he forms the earth in between these waters, which is kind of weird. Um, there's both spirit and water present. So you had spirit hovering over the water. You had a picture of a new creation and a picture of birth. It's, it's almost like he forms the earth in a womb. And he has the waters above and the waters below. In 2 Corinthians, next slide, honey. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And in John 3, 5, it says, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So here again, we see this reference to spirit and water, just like we see in the creation story, right? So number two, we have the great flood. So in Genesis 6, 17 to 18, it says, And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. You shall go into the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your and the wives with you. And also in First Peter it says, by whom he also went to preach the spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through the water. There is also an antitype which now saves us: baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here even Peter is comparing baptism to Noah's time with the flood. So with Noah's example in the Old Testament, this is a picture of the death of all flesh, right? Next slide. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. It's a picture of the death of all flesh, it's a picture of a covenant with God. It's a picture of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and a picture of waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. So remember when he sent out the dove? Mm -hmm. He was waiting on that dove to come back. 
So it's, it's the same with baptism. You get baptized with water. Now you're waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. Um, you know, there was two times that the Holy Spirit came to the disciples. The first time, Jesus breathed breath into them, right? And they received new life and became a new creation. But then he said, go wait in a room and my spirit will come to you. And that's a, a different baptism. So we'll talk about that. They had that. to wait like 10 days or something, right? Longer than that. Till Pentecost. So the third example in the Old Testament is the Red Sea baptism. In Exodus 14, fast forward a couple of slides, hon. I I can't do both. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it says, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So we see a protection that he surrounded them with in this example of Moses. And in Nehemiah 9, it says, And you divided the sea before them, so you made a name for yourself as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them, and their persecutors you threw into the deep. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloud, pill, or pill, cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just ordinances and true laws. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. So here Nehemiah is expressing all the things that God was doing for his people in this example of Moses, right? And he's listing them. In 1 Corinthians, he compares this to baptism. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. <clears throat> all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So here again, he's comparing this whole example to baptism. So this picture of Moses gives us kind of an outline, right? That's on your next slide, honey. It's a picture of salvation, right? From, from freedom from slavery. Picture of the Lord's protection prior to baptism. So before they were baptized, he brought in this cloud, right? And this pillar of cloud protected them. And it created a space between them and the ones that wanted to destroy them. It's a picture of baptism and drinking from the rock of Christ. A picture of God leading them personally in a cloud and fire. A picture of God feeding them. And a picture of God giving his spirit to instruct them through the law and through the commands, right? So this is the third piece that we learn about baptism in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, the model for baptism, we see it in three parts. We see it at the creation, so a sign of the creation. We see the picture of death and judgment with the example of Noah, where God wipes out the earth with water. He baptizes the earth with water. And then we see the picture of spirit-led deliverance and basically a life walk with God, where the spirit came and guided them personally through Moses and said, here, do this, here, go there. Uh, he basically lit up their path and said, here's what you're doing, here's where you're going. Does that make sense, guys? Man, you talk fast and it's a lot of stuff. It's good though. Sorry. You're fine. Are you guys okay online? Can you still hear? Yes. 
So when you line these things up side by side, it gives you this shadow of baptism, right? So first, baptism, it, it has three parts. It starts with creation, where the heaven and earth is formed. There's both spirit and water present, where the creation began, this picture of the new creation. It involves a birth and a womb, right? And then you move on to the water baptism with Noah, the picture of the death of your flesh. It's a picture of a covenant with God, a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Christ. And it's a picture of waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. So you get baptized in the water, but now you go into this waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And then when it comes, you have this Moses example, right? Where you have a picture of salvation, freedom from slavery, a picture of the Lord's protection prior to baptism with the cloud and the angels. So you get baptized in the water, Holy Spirit comes around you and protects you until your baptism of the Spirit. So what's interesting, the baptism with water, you're going down into the water, right, and coming up. The baptism with the Spirit, the Spirit's coming down to you <laughs> and going back up, right? So one of them is us going down. The other one is God coming down to us. And it, it's a meeting in this rebirth. Picture God leading personally, God feeding us, God instructing us personally, right? So as we see these things line up, it's giving us a clear picture of what this baptism looks like. <clears throat> if we look in John 3, 3 to 7, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So this gives us another clue. There's a birth of flesh, there's a birth of spirit, and they're different, right? And again, in John 3, 18, he said, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So here we see an example of light and darkness. We'll talk about that in a little bit. In Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So baptism is a part of salvation, something that we have to do. But he that believes not shall be condemned. And here's where it gets interesting in Matthew 28. Jesus says, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is an interesting thing. He's saying we have to be baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And the question is, the natural question as humans is, what is that all about? What are these three different things, these three different baptisms? So Jesus commanded us baptism in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> then we're talking about Peter. Peter's talking about baptism. And it says, then Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So Jesus tells us we're to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter tells us, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you'll receive the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit, this gift. So repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and receive the Holy Spirit. So now we start seeing 
when we do this line upon line, right? Like Isaiah told us, this is how you gain understanding. We see a picture forming. So in the Old Testament, you have the new creation in Genesis, right? The beginning of baptism, the beginning of the birth in the womb. And then you have the name of the father and you have repentance, right? Peter said, repent. Jesus said, be baptized in the name of the father. And we see this first example in the creation is this womb. And the second one, this picture of Noah's time, the picture of the death and judgment where he destroyed all flesh. And then you have the name of the son. And then Peter said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is the death of the flesh, and it's showing us that it has to die. And thirdly, you have the picture of Moses, where the picture of the spirit led deliverance out of life, of slavery. This is the walk through the Red Sea, baptism in the name of the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you see how this is lining up, line upon line, to give us understanding of what's happening. So going back to baptism in the name of the Father, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You said you said picture of death and judgment. Be baptized in the name. I uh, de death and judgment, but you're saying death of spirit. Death because, of the flesh. But why the death? That doesn't happen for all of us. That that's just the judgment, right? So why? So baptism is a symbolism of the death of your flesh where you bury it with Christ in the water. Your flesh or your spirit? Because I'm still alive, but it's like the old spirit, right? Flesh. So this is the very My beginning flesh. of the series. So we're going to be talking a lot about flesh and spirit. Right. But what I'm... this is talking about. But when you get baptized, in truth, you're crucifying your flesh. You're burying it in the water. So in truth, when you come out of that water... Your flesh is dead, okay? But, hey, you're still walking around. You're still dealing with flesh, so what's going on there? And this is the process of renewing your mind to the things of the Spirit. The truth is your flesh is dead. If you believe the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you're deceived, you think you're still flesh, okay? We're going to talk about that a lot over the next Session. I guess I don't know why it's the flesh. You're saying just your mind, your thinking of the old. Yeah, way. we're going to get there. Your carnal mind. Your carnal mind. Right. But so I'm being literal because I'm thinking like no other flood. That's flesh. Right. I'm thinking spirit. Do you guys, are you with him or are you, is that? No, you, I, you're hanging on. Yeah. Cool, great. Then I'm just going to hang on and hope for, hope well, for I, to it, hope it'll, huh? Once you come out of the water. Christ no life. You're a new creation. A new life. Yeah. You're reborn. Reborn. Your old man you is come dead. Up. The flesh is dead. But yeah. now you're Born living a life in spirit. So it's different. Now you got to read this thing. Because this thing is behind. Your, your brain is behind. And you have to teach it. And train it. Train right. it. Okay. Are you guys tracking online? Yeah. Um, my mind is blown all over the wall. It's, it's a lot of, it's deep. <laughs> the first part's deep, um, but is it, it's kind of true that you're not only a new creation, but you're restored back to the, what you were originally created to be, correct? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's more like a new creation, though. It's something that wasn't done before. It's, uh, that's why they call it a new creation, Christ being the first of the new. You had the first Adam, but then you had the second Adam, and he looked a lot different. And so we are basically to, to look like the second Adam, because it says he's the firstborn of many. And we're going to talk about all this stuff, I promise, over the next. Like it's going to repeat until it's clear type of thing? Well, yeah, there's a lot to talk about around this whole idea. Of okay. Talking. So I have a question. Yes. So I was, uh, before we came here, we attended another church and. It was like they were saying or that it's not a requirement to be baptized. I tended to disagree because you see this all over the Bible. Yeah. To be baptized, that it was more of a symbolic gesture of 
showing that you believe in Christ. I believe that also, but I don't, I mean, what is your comment on is it required for so, salvation? I think as a command, you know, when Jesus said whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. I think you take the command seriously as a believer and when right. you believe you obey. But in the case of, you know, the guy that was hanging on the cross next to Jesus, Sure. God obviously is going to make his own call. You know what I mean? With certain situations and people. But if you're a believing Christian, I don't see any reason why you would seek to disobey the commands of Christ. Yeah, I mean, they were saying it wasn't necessarily disobeying. It was like you're doing this as a symbolic gesture. Oh, it's more than that. It's yeah, I mean, I, I long believed in this right there. Mm -hmm. Shall be baptized. I, I don't know how mm -hmm. much. You could determine that. When I was baptized, I saw, I mean, I see things in the other realms. Everybody's got their thing. And I've seen the other realm several times, but I saw Jesus when I was coming up. And then once I was out of the water, I saw a demon across the place. And I wasn't afraid of him anymore, but I saw him coming up. It was like, I know it wasn't just like you over the water. It was, yeah. anyway, I think yeah. it was wild. But I promise we're going to talk about this really in depth over the next session. And, and, and another thing to comment too is you're saying that the earth was baptized by water. Yeah, that's at the wild. Flood. And then, but then again, it's also predicted to be baptized by fire mm -hmm. in the end. That's, I guess, the ultimate death of the earth, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. That's the death in the end. <laughs> that's crazy. And in the yeah. beginning, it was when, because I'm singing this with the kids right now in Genesis. And, I, and I'm trying to explain to the kids, I'm like, well, that means there's water above and below. And then you showed the baby in the womb. And I feel like Brian with my brain on the wall. Where I'm like, like yeah. that's crazy. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Okay, I'll let you well, talk. Well, Sorry. One, I just went and visited the Creation Museum and the Ark. Yeah, I see Ark. Kentucky, yeah. And um, there's a film and they, they depict it really well. Oh, they show the water doing this. And then they show the Earth coming and then the, the water still mm -hmm. in heaven, and they all actually show another scene where God supposedly is above that water, too. So yeah. I know it's hard to understand here where water goes down, but yeah. what, the way they depicted it was so there's really there's something we're going to talk about today about that, about the earth being formed. Actually, we'll talk about it right now. All right. You ready, Brian? So Baptism in the name of the Father. What is the ministry of reconciliation? And let's see here. I'm going to go back to the history of creation. How many slides is that? Yeah. You just said you're going backwards? No, I'm going forward. You just said back to, oh. Uh. There we go. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm busy. Um, so in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So we established, you got Spirit and water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. He saw the light was good. He divided the light from darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So here's where it gets interesting. It says, God, let there be, or God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let, the, let it divide the waters from the waters. So he creates this bubble right. within the, it's called the firmament, it's surrounded right. by water, water above and water below. That's interesting. Uh, then it says, and God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, <clears throat> and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And God said that it was good. So consider this. This is kind of a representative of the beginning of your baptism, which is, when we looked at it line upon line, repentance. Right? So repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the name of the Father is repentance. And when you repent, 
what happens is God creates this new creation in you. It's like this wound within you, right? And once he creates that wound, you know, he divides the waters from the waters, then he allows dry land to appear within you, fertile land. And then what happens next when you have dry land? You plant a seed, right? So in order for your heart to be ready in baptism, the first step is repentance. When you truly repent for your sin, it makes your heart fertile. It allows God to form this creation in you and form dry land in you. And then he can plant the seed that he wants to plant, which is the seed of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But he can't do that until you repent, right? And so what happens a lot of times in Christianity is we skip over the repentance piece and, hey, you believe in Jesus, great, let's get baptized. And then there's no repentance. And if there's no repentance, there's nowhere to plant a seed, right? And so that person leaves there after being baptized and continues a life of sin, not thinking twice about it, not repenting, and there's no seed, right? So this is the problem. This next eight sessions, we're going to be talking about the seed, specifically the seed. And it starts, the planting of the seed starts with repentance. Does that make sense? So it falls um, off if you're not repentant. It just doesn't even stay with you. Well, if you're not repentant, there's nowhere to plant the seed because right. that creation isn't forming you. You right. know what I mean? But God wants to form that in you, but it starts with that first step, which is the repentance. And we only see that when we line this up, line upon line. Does that make sense? I heard this yesterday, something similar, but it didn't process the way you're putting it together. Right. Like, I feel like it's... So Genesis it's 1, time. 11 and 12, Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on oh, the earth. Shoot, and it sorry. was so. The earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So notice right after you have the dry land within you, after this repentance, he plants a seed. And what does that seed do? It grows up. And it produces fruit, right? And how many times do we hear in the scripture about the fruit of the spirit and the fruit that should be produced in those that truly believe? But that fruit only comes from repentance being the beginning, where God can plant a seed. So this is salvation. This is the process, right? This is the beginning of the process of salvation. That we're talking about. repentance. But this whole cycle, that's... Right. Does that make sense? Salvation. Who began the ministry with the baptism of repentance? Anybody know? Anyone? Who? John, John the Baptist. Right. John the Baptist began this ministry. So in Matthew 3, it says, Then Jerusalem went out to him. Hey, somebody needs to mute because it's heavy. Somebody mute, or all you guys can mute. No. It'll get rid of that echo. Then Jerusalem went out to him in all, the region, in all the region around Jordan, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sin. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And then, not to say within yourselves, say that within yourselves. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I, John the Baptist, indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So notice John the Baptist, he didn't even do a full baptism. He just was responsible for the baptism of repentance. This is the first step. But Christ had to come and die 
for the remainder of salvation, the remainder of the rebirth to occur. But he was tasked with that one task. And then in Acts 19, it says, he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said to them, to what then were you baptized? And they said, to John's baptism. Then Paul said, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So here we see an example of a people that had received the baptism of repentance, but they hadn't received the baptism in the name of Jesus, and they hadn't received the Holy Spirit, right? So there's more to baptism than just getting dunked. There are steps to this salvation. And it begins with that repentance. Uh, if you don't know what a mikvah is, this was a, a process uh, in, in Hebrew culture, it still is today, of uh, baptism. But baptism in the Hebrew culture, you get baptized when there's going to be a change in your role. So if I am a child becoming an adult, going through a bar mitzvah, I'm going to go through a mikvah. And I go from being a boy to a man. If I am a uh, a guy that's getting married, I go through a mikvah because I'm going from a man to a husband, right? If I am a, a father that has a wife and we're going to have a child, both the husband and the wife go into a mikvah because their roles forever changes from just man to father or mother, right? So it's a symbolism of something that forever changes who you are and your role, right? And this is what baptism is for us. When we go into baptism, it forever changes our role. We become something completely different than we were before, and there's no going back. It's, it's who we are, right? So baptism in the name of the Son, the second step to baptism, we saw in Noah's time, it's the picture of the death of the flesh. It's going in the water. It's a picture of covenant with God, a picture of a good conscience towards God, a picture of waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. So this is the process of when we go down in that water, right? We've repented for our sin. So we're receiving the baptism of the Father through our repentance. Now we go down into the water because we believe in Jesus, and basically we're killing off that old man. We're destroying him getting rid of it, crucifying it for Christ, burying it. And then we come out of that water, and now we're waiting on something when we come out of that water. In Romans 6, 3 to 10, it says, Don't you know that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we were we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Know that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, for in, in that he died. He died to sin once. Being that he lives, he lives unto God. So this gives us kind of a picture of what it looks like when we get baptized. We're crucified with Christ. Our flesh is dead. And so what we try to do when we're walking in flesh, when we're not renewing our mind, is we try to revive our flesh. We try to breathe life back into it. And so we get offended. We get hurt. We get frustrated. We get mad because somebody violated our rights. But the answer to that is a dead man has no rights. Because he's dead. So we have to reckon ourselves dead. This is how Christ went through his life. He reckoned himself dead. 
He didn't go through life offended. He loved. People spit on him. He forgave. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He didn't take personal offense because that thing was done with. It was dead, right? And so we're supposed to walk that out as believers, but it involves a renewal, a renewal of our minds. It says, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, why as though living in this world are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things resemble wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in honor to the satisf that satisfying of the flesh. Again, you're dead with Christ. Your flesh is no longer living. It's a disturbing picture. And then, wait, sorry. And in Luke 5, sorry. it says, and he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will tear the new and the piece, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skids. Otherwise, the wine will burst and skins will be spilled out and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. So what we try to do when we revive our flesh, it's like trying to take the Holy Spirit and put it into our old man. Right. And what Jesus is saying, you can't do that. Your old man is dead. You have to reckon him dead. Now you have a new life in Christ and all of your lust of your flesh, everything of your flesh, gone, it's done, right? Don't revive it. That's what he's telling us. It's dead. Keep it dead. Now you have to renew your mind to the things of the spirit. So God's not trying to fix you, right? He's not trying to fix the old man. He's trying to destroy it. He's just trying to get rid of it, completely obliterate it. He wants you to have new cloth, new wine skin, new life. And then this third piece, baptism of the Holy Spirit, life and relationship. So the picture of Moses that we saw in the beginning, it's a picture of salvation and freedom from slavery. It was a picture of the Lord's protection prior to uh, the baptism with the cloud and the angel. A picture of the baptism and drinking from the rock of Christ. So free flowing water. You could drink as much as you want. A picture of leading them personally. So God personally goes with them in the desert, tells them what to do, tells them where to go. It's a picture of God feeding them, giving them all the food that they need. A picture of God giving his spirit to instruct them. He gave laws, commands, all of that stuff, right? This is the picture that we see. So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? That's the next question. There's three different methods that are presented in Scripture to receiving the Spirit. First one is God sends it on his own. Uh, this is the disciples at Pentecost. Uh, you look at Cornelius in the example with the, the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit while Peter's standing there watching it. Peter didn't say, Holy Spirit, come. God decided to give them the Holy Spirit because of their hearts in front of Peter to send Peter a message. So God can do it on his own. And as a matter of fact, God can do whatever he wants to do. And no man can stand in the way that God wants to do. So God has the power to do that on his own. The second example is the laying on of hands that we see in the scripture in Acts 8. It says, then they began laying their hands on them and they are receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So we can see that it can be conveyed from believer to believer through the hands. Again, in Acts 9, it says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, oh, and the next verse is, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. 
So over and over again, we see this example, a whole bunch of laying on of hands. And then there's a third message or method. And that's to aspirate yourself. In Luke 11, it says, and I say to you, ask and it shall be given and seek, you shall find, knock and it will be opened. Shoot. For everyone that asks receives, he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it is open. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will he instead give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If then being evil, no, if you being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So this example tells us we can ask him for it and he'll give it to us. So there's all kinds of methods to us receiving the Holy Spirit. The question is, are we doing all of these things that baptism is, is requiring and all the things that are laid out in the scripture that we go through? And how do you know that you receive the Holy Spirit? If we look to scripture, Transformation is the biggest key, right? The gospel without transformation is not the gospel at all. When the true gospel comes to a man and he's truly reborn, it transforms his life. And it may not happen immediately. It happens the same way a, a tree grows up. You plant a seed and it starts to grow and it gets bigger and bigger and it gets fed and watered and bigger and eventually it's huge and eventually it's producing fruit and then birds perching up in its branches, right? So this is the picture of the rebirth, but it involves a gradual transformation. Sometimes it's instant. Sometimes people are like instantly changed or instantly freed from certain things, but you grow in the fruits of the spirit, uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit voice, which we're gonna talk about that a lot over the next few weeks. What does that sound like? How do we know the Holy Spirit? How do we understand that there's a voice? And then speaking in tongues in the scripture was also another representation of somebody that received Holy Spirit. So whatever is born of flesh is flesh, whatever is born of spirit is spirit. So on the left, we have the seed of Adam, the first creation that's fallen. We can see when he fell, the spirit became darkened. It fell into darkness. And he had sin just coming out of his being, right? It was very natural. And he had sin coming in from the outside, sin coming, coming out from the inside. You can see that center is the spirit, on the outside is the body. And then in between those two things, the combination of body and spirit is the living soul. But sin was just rampant through the man. But on the right is the picture of the reborn. This is the one that receives a new seed that's completely different than the old. The old one, it kills that thing, completely destroys it, right? And now you still have a body, this thing that you're dealing with, the flesh, carnal mind, right? But your spirit has changed. So your flesh still desires to sin from the outside, but something on the inside produces righteousness. And so this is the beginning of the war that we're going to talk about over the next eight sessions. There's a war that's going on in your mind, and it starts with this process of baptism. Does that make sense? Okay. So here we see the two examples. On the left, you can see the body and the flesh. Here, I'll go up here and just try to explain it. But you've got body and flesh over here. Here's the, the spirit of man who knows the things of man. So this is the first creation. This is Adam. Uh, the spirit of a dog knows how to be a dog, right? The spirit of a lion knows how to be a lion. Tells a lion what to do. Tells him to go hunt. Tells him who to, how to find a mate. All that stuff. The spirit of a man teaches him the things of a man, okay? So this is his natural spirit. And the combination of these two things creates a soul and a personality and there's a voice that comes from the body and there's a voice over here that comes from the spirit and before you're reborn these two voices are in agreement they like sin that makes sense 
He also has Satan out there who's also trying to deceive and trying to keep you in sin and keep you entrenched. Okay. Uh, so this is the fallen man. He's trained by the world, flesh of man, wisdom of the world, spirit of this age. This is not Jesus. He's selfish. He's focused on me only. It's all about me. Everything in life is about me. Self preservation. This guy over here, he gets hurt. He's discouraged. He's bitter. He's angry. How could you do that to me? He's always feeling wrong. He's determined. He himself determines what's good and evil, right? So this guy has created a God in himself. Whenever we say to ourselves, and this is good for me, you know, it may not be good for them, but it's good for me. And we're deciding for ourselves what's good and evil. And we don't care what God thinks. Then we become our own God. And this is fallen man, right? But over here, now you have the reborn man. So you still have the flesh. This hasn't changed, right? But now this old spirit of man is done, it's dead, it's gone, and you receive this new spirit of love that comes in here on the right. And notice there's a throne. The way that we were created, we all have a throne in our heart, and we all worship something. It's just how we were created. Satan desires to sit on the throne of our heart. That's where he desires to sit, but it's Christ's rightful place, right? And so over here, we could put ourselves on that throne. We could be worshiping ourselves as our own gods, deciding what's good and evil. We could be allowing Satan to decide what's good and evil, right? But over here, when we receive the new spirit, guess who's sitting on that throne? Christ. And so now we have a different perspective. Notice we have a voice here, same voice in the bottom. You're still getting thoughts from your flesh. They could be lustful thoughts. They could be all kinds of evil things. Whatever it is, that voice doesn't go away. But now you have a different voice over here. And so this is the beginning of the conflict within you. Now there's a war. The war is on, and it's not a war you can see with your eyes. It's a war within the man. Does that make sense? So now we've got this is man over here. It's the Holy Spirit, love. God's Spirit comes in. He makes residence in your heart. He sits on the throne of your heart. He convinces, convicts your conscience concerning selfishness, which is the root of all sin, pride. He restores you to creation value, begins the process of transformation, but our job is this. He does all the hard work. Our job is just to renew our mind. That's all we're supposed to do. So we're supposed to take every thought captive into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So when we get that thought, that lustful thought, this new man is different than this old man. You get that lustful thought, but then you get another thought. Hey, man, that's not good. You don't need to be thinking that. That's evil. What are you doing? Right? And then if you carry through with that lustful thought, all of a sudden you feel guilt. You feel condemnation. You feel shame. Guess what that comes from? Holy Spirit convicts you. It says, no, you can't do that. You know what I mean? And then you feel like a horrible person when you do those things. This is the Holy Spirit, the beginning of teaching you to put that thing to death. So some people look at those activities and things and they say, that's a bad thing. I rather say, that's the beginning of life. You know what I mean? When you have that conflict in you, that means you've got life in you now. And that life is teaching you to do good. And that's the Holy Spirit. And that's a good thing. So you start celebrating. When you heed the voice of God, when you listen to the voice of God, you start celebrating that. Because now you're walking with him. And as you have these successes, you feel closer and closer to the Lord. And eventually, you don't even recognize this guy anymore. Because he's so dead. Like, you don't even think about him or his thoughts or his lust or anything. You've grown into a big tree. And now the birds are up in your branches and you are nourishing everybody that you come into contact with. So when you go out to your family, when you go out to people in the community, they look at you and you're constantly, they, they want to be around you because they get life, they get sustenance, they get their thirst quenched, they get fed wherever you go. Does that make sense? This is the reaper. Do you guys have questions online? 
Nope. Okay. So moving on. Second Corinthians 10, it says, But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So this is telling us, right? Here's the war, but the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, they're spiritual, and they pull down those strongholds. And those strongholds could be addiction. The strongholds could be lust. It could be alcoholism. It could be all kinds of different things that have oppressed you for years and years and years. It could be anger. And basically, the, this weapon of the Holy Spirit casts those strongholds down. And this is where you, you become free. This is the truth that sets you free. Did Jesus have a carnal mind? Is the question. Does anybody know the answer? Yes. That's right. He did. Remember when Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done? He had a will apart from the Father's. This was his carnal mind. When he was going to die, he didn't want to die. Jesus had a carnal mind. He was so scared he cried blood. He cried blood. His body was screaming out, no, no, you don't want to go. You don't want to die. This is not good. But then he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. His will being the will of the flesh that he was walking in because he was terrified, right? But he overcame that voice. This is what fasting was for, right? So fasting was the process of taking control of this flesh. So when you fast, you're super hungry. I don't know if you ever tried fasting, but you're super hungry and your body's screaming out, you need to eat something, you've got to be starving, go eat something. But then your spirit says, shut up and do what I tell you to do. And that's the process of fasting. It's taking control of that voice of the flesh and bringing it into the submission of the will of the Holy Spirit. And so that was the whole purpose behind it. What are you baptized into? Because now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, for it has been declared me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The point here is, we're only baptized in one name. And this baptism of different types has led to division, even back then, because people were saying, hey, I'm baptized by Paul, I'm baptized by Titus or whoever, and they would become divided because of that, right? Um, Somebody wants to join. I don't know how to do it, though. It says people are waiting in the lobby. Did you guys invite somebody? Or did somebody get booted? Oh, let me see here. Yeah, Dad got booted. All right, hold on. I'll let him back in. Just this time, though. Mm -hmm. It's five dollars every time, right? <laughs> All right, there we go. You back in, Dad? He's trying to communicate. Yeah, he's in. Okay. He was just learning the mute button. Uh, this first Corinthians says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I have baptized I have to learn the name. name. <laughs> yes, I also baptized this household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. John, I'm going to get curious time frame just because I don't want the chickens to die. What time is it? We're almost done. You're, you're, okay, it's fine. I just wanted to. Okay. So this is where we have all these divisions. And my point is there's no division in Christ. 
it doesn't matter where somebody is or you know what church they're in or you know hey your baptism counts but mine doesn't count if you're baptized into christ you're of one body and these divisions are not of god you know the scripture says they're one faith one baptism one body one spirit one lord one god one hope there is no division among believers so we can't get sucked into that mindset ever of oh those Presbyterians over there or those Catholics or whoever, if they are truly in Christ, they're at the body and they're with us, right? Uh, and then in terms of avoiding divisions, this is a great text in First Corinthians. It says, and these things, brethren, I have a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So this is another error. You have men that say, well, it means this. And this guy said, nope, it means this. And then they divide and then they go their own ways and it creates this division. No man is above what's written. If you have a disagreement, just go back to what's written. <laughs> and just stay there, but don't be divided, right? So if we wanna know who we are, and this is kind of wrapping up, in terms of baptism, when we go through true baptism, our identity changes, and we're going to talk about this a bunch over the next several weeks. The scripture tells us who we are after baptism. It says we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're sons, we're saints. God's spirit resides in us. We have access to the throne. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're a new creation. The king is our daddy. As he is, so are we in the world. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're the body of Christ. We're blessing Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We are a light to the nations. We're called according to his purpose. We're God's chosen ones. The old man is dead. Your life is not yours. You're seated in heavenly places. You're valued by God, highly valuable, and he paid a high price to redeem you. He basically gave up everything. I think we forget what our value is a lot of times because of the flesh and its deception. But we were that valuable that he decided to give up everything to preserve us. I think that's the end. <clears throat> Does that make sense, guys? Yes. So far? So basically, we're just diving in deep to baptism, and the reason we're starting there is because of the seed and understanding the planting of the seed. So the next several sessions, we're going to be talking about the seed a lot more deeply. You know, in terms of what does this look like when the seed is planted? What's going on inside of me? What's going on inside of my head? How can I discern what's happening in front of me? And how can I walk out this new birth that we have? We're going to talk about the carnal mind a ton, uh, the will of the flesh. You know, we're going to talk about the spirit and how the spirit operates and all that stuff. And then we're going to talk about Jesus and what he commanded and what he said. And we're going to talk about uh, Paul and how Paul's writings are confusing. And we'll talk about why they're confusing and how they don't have to be. But uh, there's certain things that have caused division from Paul's writings. And uh, it's it a lot of that context. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's all context. It's, a, it's all context. Yeah, it's take who he's talking to about. Paul. That's right. So, but that's all we have today. Um,